Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome to Lost in Adaptation, a review show about comparing the plot and theme accuracy of film adaptations to the books that inspired them. The War of the Worlds was the work of a turn of the 19th and 20th century British author by the name of Herbert George Wells, or H.G. Wells as he's more commonly referred to. I usually try not to gush too much in these reviews, but the impact that H.G. Wells had on writing and the genre of science fiction in particular cannot be overstated. I mean, you can't really say that any one person invented something like a genre, but he sure as fuck was a massive factor in it. He's been dubbed both the father of science fiction and the Shakespeare of science fiction since his death. I mean, he's considered up there with the likes of Jules Verne and Hugo Gernsback. His predictions were so visionary and ahead of their time that people believed that they actually advanced real life science. Robert Goddard, the man who invented the liquid fueled rocket and jump started the space age, claimed that he was a huge fan of Wells and was inspired in part by his ideas. The War of the Worlds was originally a serialized story released in multiple magazines throughout 1897, then published in hardback a year later. You can totally tell when you're reading it, the different parts of the story are very compartmentalised. It was not Wells' first foray into the realms of science fiction, as he had published the also extremely popular and much adapted The Time Machine a few years earlier. Judging from the Patreon survey, a plot synopsis of the book might be in order for this one. If you're already familiar with it, and for some bizarre reason don't want to listen to the sultry tones of my voice as much as possible, here's the point to skip to. Set in the At The Time contemporary 1890s, the book centres around an unnamed protagonist who appears to be living in fairly comfortable wealth in southern England with his wife and servants. In this version of reality, Mars is just as inhabitable as Earth, though it's starting to become less so because it started its life cycle much sooner and is therefore reaching the natural end of it. The Martian inhabitants, being an older race, had evolved far past humans and developed their technology to a much higher level. So, when their world started to become decidedly sucky, they decided to help themselves to ours. To this end, they smell a giant gun, filled some large canisters with a ton of machine parts and half a dozen Martians, and fired a bunch of them at Earth over a period of several days. A few months later, they all landed in England, and the first happened to come down quite near the village that the protagonist lived in, so he got a good look at the Martians coming out. His description of them put me slightly to mind of a deformed, grey, oily-skinned octopus, but with a much bigger head, smaller, more delicate tentacles, and a hideous face on the front. As the Martians seemed to be having trouble moving around in Earth's stronger gravity, so much so they couldn't seem to climb out of the pit that their crash cylinder spaceships had made, humans didn't consider them much of a threat at first, even after they killed several people trying to talk to them using a heat ray blast. It wasn't until they finished building their giant three-legged death machines to ride around in that people realised what a deep doo-doo they were in. During this time, the lead, being smarter than the average Gorka, had taken his wife to stay with his cousin in another, slightly further away town. Upon his return, he discovers that an army of soldiers had been sent to deal with the Martians, but they'd all been wiped out, and now the invaders were strolling around the countryside laying waste to everything. He teams up with one of the very few surviving soldiers, an artillery man, who helps him flee the area. Along the way, they see that the British army is setting up massive gun batteries to combat the Martians, and at first they do put up an impressive defence, even successfully destroying a single tripod. However, once the Martians start using not only their heat ray, but also a long-range gas attack, all resistance is quickly swept aside. The elite narrowly escapes death yet again as he's caught up in a massacre, as the aliens attack a large group of people attempting to cross a river by boats. Shortly later, he meets up with another survivor, a town curate. I have to confess, I had to stop reading at this point to look up what a curate is. Apparently, it's a religious occupation, basically a priest's assistant. The narrative switches slightly at this point as the lead puts his story on hold to describe his brother's experience with the invasion. His brother lived in London, so you see how city dwellers dealt with the news of the alien invasion, which is to say that they also completely underestimated the threat and until they were basically walking their tripods down the Thames, then they all try to evacuate at once in a massive panic. The lead's brother fares better than most, making it all the way to the coast and paying an extortionate price to a steamship captain to take him to France. His ship and a fleet of other escape vessels might have met a sticky end as three tripods arrived to stop them escaping, but they were saved by the sacrifice of a navy ironclad named Thunderchild that sacrificed itself to kill two of them. Returning to the lead, he travels with the curate for a while, though he finds him cowardly selfish, slow-witted, and has limited patience for a man so weak-minded as to lose his head in a situation like this. They have the very bad luck to take refuge in a house that gets partially demolished by the arrival of the last alien cylinder, and end up trapped in the cellar. Through a hole in the rubble, they get to watch the aliens building their big machines using small machines, and, much to their distress, them using machines to suck all the blood out of some human prisoners to transfuse into themselves. This is apparently how the Martians sustain themselves. The lead theorizes that they evolved away their 
need for a digestive tract by taking pre-nourished blood from other creatures. Huh. I wonder if that technically makes them vampires. At this point, the curate completely loses what's left of his mind and starts bellowing scripture. The Elite, concerned that he's going to alert the nearby Martians to their presence, strikes him about the head, killing him. The Martians make a somewhat half-assed cursory investigation of the cellar with a robotic tentacle, but don't find the lead, who later escapes and wanders the now decimated countryside of England alone, until he happens to come across another survivor, none other than the artillery man that he met earlier in the story. He seems to have thought out some big plans for starting an underground society with everyone who's tough enough to escape the Martians, building a world in the basements and sewers until they've learned enough about the Martians to steal their technology and reclaim the Earth. The lead is initially impressed with how quickly he's adapted to the new situation, and is swept up in his optimism for an outcome in which the human race is not completely exterminated. However, he quickly realises, on seeing how little progress this former soldier has made towards this ideal, that the man is all talk and lacks the stamina and commitment to see any of his plans through. Disappointed the protagonist takes his leave of the artillery man and, having given up hope entirely, wanders into London and towards the first tripod he sees in the hopes of ending it all. To his surprise, the war machine is completely shut down and the Martians within are super dead. He learns later that, either through Martian meddling or by some freak of evolution, Mars is devoid of any pathogens, so the Martians, possessing no immune system, had all died of the viruses a human body would have easily fought off. The lead goes a bit mad after this and has to be looked after by some other survivors. When he regains his senses, he is heartbroken to be informed that the town he left his wife in for safekeeping was completely destroyed, so she and his family members are surely dead. However, returning to the ruins of his home village and what's left of his house, he is surprised to meet them there, alive and well against all the odds, so the book ends on a slightly happy note. It's mentioned in the epilogue that humanity doesn't expect the Martians to return, but are keeping an eye on the Red Planet anyway, and astronomers notice strange activity on Venus, so they think there's a chance that the aliens chose to settle there instead. I stand by my statement that Wells was an absolute visionary, but as you can see, he did not get everything right. Most noticeably, believing that all the planets in the solar system have the potential to support life, and assuming that being fired out of what is essentially a giant cannon would be the most effective way of leaving a planet's atmosphere. Some essential scientific discoveries that later dictated how space travel would actually work just hadn't been conceived of yet in his lifetime, so if he had been bang on the money, I would probably be calling witchcraft right about now, or assuming that he did in fact invent a time machine. It's the fact that he got people thinking about it that's so amazing. You have to understand that Wells published this book theorising extraterrestrial invasion almost a decade before the Wright brothers left the soil of North Carolina on their first powered flight. It seems slightly weird to me that he wrote that only England was attacked. Presumably the Martians were going to move on to the other parts of the world once the greatest empire of the time was crippled, but it still seems odd to me that they initially limited themselves to assaulting one island nation out of the whole planet. The ending is admittedly somewhat anticlimactic in book form. Things get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and then it's all just over. You can feel the tension of turn of the century Europe with its superpowers that are starting to butt heads dangerously within the pages of this book. I think at one point Wells says that the arrival of the Martians initially caused significantly less of a stir than a declaration of hostility from Germany would have. Anyways, in 1938 another man by the name of Wells, this time with the first name of Orson, adapted the story into a radio drama that essentially pretended to be a collection of emergency news broadcasts, military communications, and interviews with witnesses that took place during the alien invasion that's described in the book. The first half of this drama, rather than focusing on H.G. Wells' lead character or his storyline, mostly stuck to the major world-shaking events of the plot. The second half is a single survivor recounting exactly what happened to him, and as a result is much closer to the experience of reading the book, adapting the lead's second meeting with the artilleryman and the discovery of the unexpectedly dead Martians very closely. This particular adaptation is notorious for the claim that some people tuning in after the intro explaining it and not realising that the broadcast was fictitious were under the impression that there really was an alien invasion in progress and were moved to panic. And disappointingly, from what I've been able to discover, this claim is at best hugely exaggerated and at worst completely made up by the newspapers at the time for sensationalism reasons and in an attempt to attack Wells for his foolish and most unorthodox attempt at entertainment. Oh yes, this bizarre man will amount to nothing in the future, you mark my words. Another famous 
famous adaptation of the story took the form of a film in 1953, created by producer George Pal and director Byron Haskin. The modernization that took place with every retelling of the story became more noticeable here, as the difference in human society between when the book was written and the 50s was pretty extreme. The science, fictional and real, is advanced along with the time period. Human weapons had become massively more deadly, so the Martians had to as well. The canister-delivered gas attacks are replaced by electromagnetic blasts that render most human technology inert. And the alien war machines now pack energy shields that no human weapon can penetrate, not even the fearsome atomic bomb. Said war machines hover in this version instead of walking around on three legs. I suspect because it's much easier to use models with no moving parts. As I mentioned, the A-bomb is deployed against the aliens in this version of the story, though its effect on the plot is pretty minor because it is utterly useless. Another interesting change is this film's attitude towards religion. While the lead in the book was pious enough to occasionally pray to God for salvation in very dire straits, the only representative of organized religion in the story was a sniveling, short-sighted coward. The film not only included a brave priest who sacrificed himself for the greater good trying one last time to communicate with the aliens before all-out war broke out, it also basically gives God full credit for stepping in and defeating the Martians using microorganisms at the end, which is a bold statement. Wells did say that God put bacteria on the Earth, but I'm pretty sure he was just talking poetically, and I don't think he ever intended to imply that the aliens died because people prayed for it super hard. In 1978, a composer called Jeff Wayne released his own adaptation of the story in the form of a musical album that I cannot play you one note of for copyright reasons. It combined a narration of a very condensed and paraphrased version of the book into what I'm told is progressive rock and a string orchestra. I'm not really a music guy, so I'm a bit out of my depth here. There's a talking narrator, a singing narrator, and then from track 7 onwards, some of the characters start performing their own songs. Both the artillery man and the curate, now a pastor, have their own solos, and they are ridiculous. The artillery man sings for 12 fucking minutes about living in the sewers. Considering this unusual medium, this adaptation is surprisingly plot accurate, covering a lot of the main events of the novel. Major deviations include combining the lead's brother's part of the book into the leads, and a song where he makes his way to the coast and sees his significant other on a ship that he can't quite get to before it leaves. They also add a second epilogue that skips forward in time, presumably to the 70s, where NASA is attempting to send a probe to Mars and gets signs that another invasion might be coming. Interestingly, the Martian's death whale, described as a Oola sound in the book is repeatedly used in the album songs. And this album is on the list of bestsellers of all time in the UK. Again, I'm not much of a music guy, but I'm told if you enjoy Pink Floyd, you'll probably like this. There have been multiple video game adaptations of Wells' novel over the years, and even one that's technically an adaptation of an adaptation, because it specifically claims to be based on Jeff Wayne's interpretation. The reason I bring that up is there's a cinematic in it involving a train being set aflame that might actually have been referenced in the film we're about to talk about. In 2005, a bloke called Steven Spielberg decided to take another swing at the War of the Worlds, making full use of the massive advancements in computer-generated imagery that had occurred over the last decade. This film is the main subject of this episode of Lost in Adaptation. As a film, it was... okay. OK seems to be the general consensus. It received good reviews, but no one seems to remember it as a masterpiece. The two younger characters that Spielberg introduced received some hate at the time, becoming the go-to punchbag punchlines in parody movies like Scary Movie 4, but on reviewing, I've become strongly of the opinion that we were all too hard on them. The lead is the real jackass in this story. These kids are just acting appropriately freaked out by the situation, as far as I can see. Considering this film's about 14 years old now, the CGI has actually held up incredibly well. I've seen newer films that have aged much worse than this. I have to confess, I went into this one expecting this adaptation to be in name only, and it was very close to it, super borderline. I flip-flopped on the decision to declare it such a dozen times, but I finally landed on it including just enough of the book to escape such a designation. So with that in mind, let's talk adaptation. <laughs> Plot-wise, the film stuck to... Well, it's kind of hard to put an estimate on it, to be honest. Let me just list it and let you decide for yourself. Extraterrestrial invaders attempting to wipe out humanity using giant three-legged robot fighting machines so they could claim the Earth for themselves, and the human military being completely ineffective at stopping them, there being such a huge disparity in their technology levels. Civilians attempting to flee from the invaders with unfortunately limited success in most cases. The aliens eventually switching from just killing everyone they come across to capturing them so they can suck out their blood 
later. The aliens spreading a red route around, possibly to reverse terraform the planet to make it nicer for them. A tense moment of the lead hiding from a robotic tentacle looking for him in a basement he's taking cover in. And the classic ending, despite their vastly superior war machines, the aliens eventually all dying from the viruses and bacteria of Earth, to which mankind has built up an immunity over the course of our existence, but to which they have no defense. These things, and stuff like the panicked masses stampeding over each other in an animalistic desire to prioritize their own survival over everyone else's, is pretty much universal to every adaptation. However, despite having the biggest disparity in things like setting and time period, I think Spielberg captured some of the book's original spirit in a way few others even tried to. First and foremost is the fact that this is very much a story of one man's personal experience with the alien invasion. This film is not a story about how the world as a whole, any government or armed forces command dealt with this situation, it's about this one entirely unexceptional person who happened to be at Ground Zero, several mass exterminations and military confrontations, and survived by the skin of his teeth, mostly through insanely good luck. Along with this is the story-spanning fixation with protecting a family member. In the book it was the lead's efforts to get his wife out of danger, then his continued attempts to return to her. In the movie it's primarily the protagonist's attempts to protect his estranged children, but the sentiment is the same, I think. An aggregate representative of both the artilleryman and the curate appears in the film in the form of the survivalist that the father and daughter briefly hide with in the basement. He talks a big game about long-term plans for counter-attack from below, just like the artilleryman, and subsequently loses his mind, forcing the lead to kill him for fear that he's going to give away their position to the aliens, the very fate of the curate of the book. It's also interesting to me that the film paid homage to the aliens attacking during an attempted river crossing, and the desperate, partially submerged chaos that ensued. The imagery of the boat making an emergency cast-off, abandoning people to their doom, is also very reminiscent of the escape across the channel, the end of the lead's brother's part of the book. And the final plot twist of a relative believed lost miraculously turning up at the end with no explanation as to how they survived is also a nice tie-in to the book. Surprise, motherfucker! To list all the differences between this film and book would require a seven-part series, so I fear I must restrict myself to the changes I personally found the most interesting. It almost goes without saying that all these same things I said about the 1953 version regarding the alien science and technology being upgraded applies doubly to this film. In fact, Spielberg borrowed heavily from the 1950s adaptation, it seems. Like... Really, really heavily in some places. Most notably in regards to the aliens, he incorporated the electromagnetic pulse that knocked out human communications and technology, and the energy shields that protect the tripods from human counterattack. The shields are even more necessary to the story now because it's much harder to miss with 21st century weaponry, and they make sizably big explosions even when compared to the 1950s. This film goes even further as the Martians' original heat rays replaced with their, yeah. Uh... Well, I'm not entirely sure what that is. It seems to be whatever is most dramatically convenient to the plot. A light that evaporates biological matter while leaving clothing behind, or a force that can blow the roof off a house, or an incineration beam that can set a bunch of AVs on fire. I just don't get why the aliens would want to keep human clothing intact. Is their plan to put our defeated trousers on their heads as they perform their victory parade? The electronics frying pulse is now delivered by an artificially created lightning storm, which isn't all that relevant, but I wanted to mention because I thought it was cool. I think the setting of this story being moved from Britain to America is also tied into this modernization, which is why I'm not adding this particular thing to my Americans always need to be the center of attention list. A big part of this story is how shocking it's supposed to be that the most powerful military on Earth is swept aside in a matter of days. When the book was written, the country deserving that title was arguable, now it's undeniably America's. Because we now know that Mars is definitely not inhabited by an advanced race of douchebags, the aliens that come calling so rudely uninvited are interstellar instead of just extraterrestrial. In this version of events, their tripedal war machines were buried and waiting for them on Earth for an unknown number of years, almost certainly put there long before humanity started developing civilization. How and why is never really addressed in the film. While the blood theft is in the movie, its use is radically different. Instead of being the Martian source of sustenance, it's sprayed around as fertilizer for their red weed. In the flesh, the aliens don't bear much of a resemblance to the Martians of the book. Gone is Wells' belief that, if given enough time, a highly intelligent race will eventually evolve away their need for anything other than a brain, eyes, and manipulators, leaving behind what is essentially a very smart blob, replaced with... 
uh, these guys. I think Spielberg wanted to downplay the grotesque and ramp up the intimidation factor, but he ended up with a cheap knockoff of the Independence Day chappies, and I personally thought they were kind of lame. As you undoubtedly noticed, in addition to not naming his lead, Wells had a habit of not giving away the names of any of the big players in his story, so we heard a lot about the artillery man, the curate, my wife, and my brother. This would have been difficult but not impossible for the film to recreate, but I can see why they didn't bother. Everybody gets a name. The protagonist, played by Tom Cruise, is called Ray, though that's probably a bad example because in my experience, when Tom Cruise plays a character in a movie, most people will forget his name and just say, oh yeah, Tom Cruise's character. Ray is a blue-collar dock worker, a far cry from the upper-class published philosopher of the book who was so keen to congratulate himself for his intelligence all the time. As I said, there is no great climax to the book. The Martians just drop dead in the final chapter with zero funfair. Again, though, I can kind of see why this wouldn't fly with the film. So, they added in the kerfuffle with Ray personally killing a tripod from within using hand grenades and him noticing an alien shields were down so some soldier boys could kill it with a rocket launcher. The parallels to a much more popular Spielberg adaptation, Jurassic Park, are very strong here. In both movies, Spielberg kept to the premise of the book but added in a massive fatherhood subplot for the lead that was certainly not there before. In the case of Jurassic Park, because Grant actually liked children, and in the War of the Worlds, because the lead was originally childless. I don't object to the idea of using the hero's desire to protect his family to drive the plot. In fact, as I said, that's actually kind of book accurate, as the lead spent a lot of time travelling with his wife or thinking about her safety. However, what I do object to is the plot grinding to a halt again and again and again for Spielberg to spell out to the audience exactly what dysfunction this family is going through at that particular moment. After a while, you have to start to wonder if the aliens are being treated as a background menace to drive the family-related plot forward. Too much, Stephen. Too much. You and me? I don't think we're on the same page. <laughs> There's no battle between the tripods and a naval warship like in the novels, so the Thunder Child gets no representation, which is a bit of a shame. The song about it from the 70s album is pretty good. Because the aliens come out of the ground fully locked and loaded and immediately start wrecking things, a large and interesting part of the book, humanity demonstrating its hubris by insisting on underestimating the Martians right up until the moment they march into London, is left out. This could be considered one of Wells' key points of the novel, so it's arguably a large sin of adaptation omission. In the same way that we now know that Mars is regretfully not going to be a fashionable vacation spot anytime soon, we also know that Venus is a hellhole of sulfuric acid and deadly high pressure, so obviously that was not the alien's plan B in the film. The Dom's final thoughts. So obviously by my usual stringent standards this isn't a very accurate adaptation at all, but I have to confess to being somewhat charmed by the way that they worked the things that were book accurate into the modernised setting. However, I really don't want to set a precedent for making excuses for film adapters that clearly wish to impress their own vision onto an incompatible story, as I've been very harsh on that sort of thing in the past and will no doubt be again when confronted with the work of a less talented director. Spielberg and his crew clearly had their own story that they wished to tell, and it kind of elbowed the book their film was supposed to be based on aside almost completely, which is a shame if not a surprise. Pretty much every adaptation that ever got made changed it so the entire world got attacked, so I guess I wasn't the only one who thought it was a bit weird that the aliens picked on the English in particular. Most adaptations Adaptations also chose to focus on the bigger picture in some capacity, introducing either more characters or having the protagonist of rubbing elbows with army generals calling these shots on Earth's defence. So, as I said, I do have to give the 2005 version props for bringing the story back to its personal story roots. So yeah, more tie-ins than I expected, but a far cry from being an accurate adaptation of the novel. So, my beautiful watchers, you might have noticed that this episode of Lost in Adaptation was a little bit different than usual. I concentrated less on naming every last detail that was changed in the film, and tried to be a bit more comprehensive about the author, the book, and the other incarnations of the story. I'm probably going to start doing this more with books that have had multiple adaptations, but if you really didn't dig it, let me know in the comments. I don't take feedback as gospel, but I of course wish to take the opinions of my audience into account when I plan future work. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers, and please remember that no one would have believed that, in the first years of the 21st century, that this world was being watched keenly and closely.
by programmed algorithms, powerful yet really bloody stupid. And that, as YouTubers busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinised and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinise the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. The only thing that could keep it at bay was liking, subscribing and encouraging one's friends to check out their channels, so if you would I'd appreciate it, see you soon. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That that's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, MY GOODNESS THE DOM, I CAN'T DO THAT! The Llama King will not allow it! The Llama King sees all! The Llama King cannot be opposed! The Llama King is everything! Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. To his surprise, he finds that the war machine is shut down and all the Martians within completely dead. Why am I saying completely? You can't be partially dead. He's just a little dead, he'll get better. The lead goes... the... There's a guy out there salvaging bits of a car with a power saw. Most inopportune timing. And has to be looked after by some other survivors when he regains... It's like he waits until I'm trying to film something. It's fine. It's fine. It's good. This is... This is this is an extra angle I needed. They wish to tell, and it kind of elbowed the book their film was supposed to be based on a side almost completely, which is a shame if not a surprise. Wisp, you're killing me, buddy! I'm gonna pet the cat for a bit and then get back to filming. You want to be at the start of the show? I'm gonna say, hello, my beautiful watchers. I'm turning into a crazy cat lady. I'm talking to the cat. I'm talking for the cat. And he's looking at my life. Good boy. So he is surprised to find them there, waiting for him alive and well, so... Now they're hitting it with a hammer. I'm having a bit of a day.